The importance of whistleblowers from the Navy to come forward about the UFO UAP phenomenon is that it can help to shed light on a phenomenon that has been shrouded in secrecy for decades. Whistleblowers can provide first-hand accounts of what they have seen or experienced, which can help to cooperate other reports and build a more complete picture of what is happening. Additionally, whistleblowers can help to raise awareness of the issue and put pressure on governments and other organizations to take it seriously. There are a number of reasons why whistleblowers from the Navy may be reluctant to come forward. They may fear retaliation from their superiors, or they may worry about being ridiculed or dismissed. However, the importance of their testimony cannot be overstated. By coming forward, whistleblowers can help to bring this important issue to light and make a real difference in our understanding of the universe. Here are some of the benefits of whistleblowers from the Navy coming forward about the UFO UAP phenomenon. Increased transparency and accountability. Whistleblowers can help to ensure that the public is aware of what is happening and that the government and other organizations are held accountable for their actions. Improve public safety. Whistleblowers can help to identify and mitigate potential risks to public safety. Enhance national security. Whistleblowers can help to protect national security by identifying and deterring threats. Increase scientific knowledge. Whistleblowers can help to advance scientific knowledge by providing valuable information about the UFO UAP phenomenon. One of the most important things that Third Phase of Moon has done is to provide a platform for whistleblowers to come forward and share their stories. In the past, whistleblowers have often been afraid to come forward because they feared retaliation from their employers or the government. The stories that have been shared on Third Phase of Moon have helped to raise awareness of the UFO phenomenon. In the past, UFOs were often dismissed as a hoax or a figment of people's imagination. However, the stories that have been shared on Third Phase of Moon have helped to show that UFOs are a real phenomenon that is being experienced by people all over the world. Third Phase of Moon has played an important role in the study of UFOs. The channel has provided a platform for whistleblowers to come forward and share their stories. And this has helped to raise awareness of the UFO phenomenon. We're going to be speaking with a Navy veteran that served on the USS Dubuque in regards to an incredible sighting he witnessed in the Pacific. Hey James, thanks for joining us right here at Third Phase Moon. I would like to get into detail of what happened aboard the Navy vessel right here off the Pacific. So it was early autumn uh, of 86 and my ship was the USS Dubuque. It was home ported in Sasebo, Japan and we were out of Sasebo bound towards the South China Sea. Could you go more in depth on the description of what you experienced that night? Well, what we used to do is, after watches, eve watches, uh, that ended about 10, 11 at night, we'd go above decks outside the ship, which we weren't even really supposed to, uh, and we'd do exercise, we'd do a workout. Um, and often we'd stargaze, because a ship at sea, a Navy ship at sea at the time, runs completely darkened, and you can have a great view of the sky. And what happened one night is uh, I looked up and I saw what appeared to be a star at first, a bright star, but then it started moving in these incredible, flying across the horizon from one end to the other and doing these figure eight patterns and uh, circles and it was just, never seen anything like it. Okay, so while you witnessed this, what was, uh, what was your reaction to what you witnessed? What was your prior thought of UFOs and what did you do immediately after this sighting? I had absolutely no belief in them whatsoever. Um, I was baffled by what I was looking at. At first I thought perhaps it was a firefly above my head, but then I realized we were two, three, four days at sea in the middle of the ocean, and what I was looking at was very high up in altitude. And when I saw the motions it was making, I realized it had to be traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour. It was faster than anything I'd ever seen, faster than even a, a, a meteorite. Tell us about these uh, angles that it, these, this uh, unidentified object was, uh, how it maneuvered. They, it was, first it kind of rocketed back and forth and then it started doing almost like a, a, an infinity pattern, if you will. Uh, then there was some circles involved and it just, it moved crazily across the sky. What was the response from your fellow shipmates to this experience you just had and did they witness it themselves? Uh, what I did is I, I went up to what was known as the 04 level, and that's where the lookouts were on the signal bridge. And I asked the guy on watch if he could see what I was seeing. I thought maybe I was seeing things. 
and he saw it too. But to my surprise, he wasn't really interested in it so much. He said, oh, maybe it's a shooting star or something. And that didn't make any sense to me because it was just going back and forth. Um, but he was totally disinterested in it. I was very surprised. Well, later in the week, um, uh, I came across a message while working in the document destruction room of all places. Um, and I saw that it was a report that had been forwarded from the Japanese self-defense force, air self-defense force, and they had been chasing a UFO um, uh, off the coast of Japan and they had some radar locks on it and the report had specific information that they had targeted it with their radar. They hadn't apparently gotten very close to it, but they had radar confirmation of what they were chasing. As far as the UFO phenomenon, what is your opinion on what the military knows? My, in my opinion, the military knows uh, quite a bit about what's going on. I don't think my sighting was the only one. Um, I think our involvement or the military's involvement is, it goes beyond what most people can even imagine. Third Phase of Moon has played an important role in the study of UFOs. The channel has provided a platform for whistleblowers to come forward and share their stories. And this has helped to raise awareness of the UFO phenomenon. Third Phase of Moon has also helped to educate the public about UFOs, and this has helped to create a more open and accepting environment for people who have had UFO experiences incredible story in regards to some kind of collision with a naval vessel named the Coronado in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, including a report from Tom himself where eyewitnesses are hazed aboard the Navy vessel if they come forward How's it going? and speak about Pretty the UFO yourself? phenomenon. So buckle up as we go on an adventure and discover something that has never been heard before by the public. Let's get to well, it. I work for the City of Los Angeles Communications or Base Maintenance. And then uh, we have the technicians who take care of the site up here. The site was owned by uh, Fox, LAPD, Fire, um, DOT, Sanitation. Everything is linked through this tower up here. So I monitor all the sites throughout the city of LA. You actually work be below the Hollywood sign itself, right? That's correct, about two floors under ground. See, I don't think many people are aware that there's actually sub, there's sub levels underneath the sign. Really. There's actually a sub level. We're in the fishbowl, as they call it, and it's basically a giant fishbowl with windows all around. And then we actually have an emergency escape if the tower was to collapse on the main door. We have an emergency escape hatch out the back. Tell me about uh, some of the sightings. You said that there was something that was a... Uh, I saw something sighting. green behind, so... My job was a IC in interior communications. So everything that had to go from one space to another was my job, including when they talk on the PA, captain settings, protocol, all that stuff was my equipment. But there's also shadows underneath, but you never were able to identify it. Some unknown creature or a craft below the surface? We don't know. I do remember seeing shadows and stuff and everybody goes and runs and starts talking about it, but again, what it was. But there were shadows underneath. If there is no ambient light anywhere, because we're in blackout conditions, it could be your eyes, we don't know. And our ship didn't have sonar. I know something broke off our, and it was called the uh, pit sword. And something we hit something going to Hawaii where it broke it off. So you had a collision with the USO underwater submerged Object. In the middle of the freaking ocean and something sheared off. But I was sent down there to replace the pit sore because we hit something in the middle of the ocean and no one knows anything about it. Now, later on in the evening, we wanted to ask Tom more questions in regards to the encounter in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. He joined us later. Listen up. I work for the city of Los Angeles in communications, which I got my training when I was in the Navy and it actually certified and got my job here. I worked for AirTouch, I worked for Verizon and telecommunications since I got out of basically high school. I joined the military two weeks after I graduated from high school. Went to boot camp, uh, graduated in that, uh, graduated almost the top of my class and I got orders to go to 
at the time San Diego and I was issue, I had orders to go on the USS Coronado AGF-11, which was a 581 foot experimental vessel. Um, that and the LaSalle was the sister ship. So there were two of them designed to be experiments. One of them, they floated a barge in it for all the high ups like the president, uh, secretary of defense and things like those. Ours, they welded up the bow and they made, you know, residential suites in the back for the higher ups. So technically I knew about the first missile launch uh, two weeks before because they were discussing it. Uh, we had- launch of what? Uh, that I can't tell you that. <laughs> just let's just put it this way: we knew where the fleet was because we were third fleet. All right. So let's talk about uh, this um, encounter. There's, you know, obviously let's get into the history of these weird experiences with unidentified flying objects, UFOs, as the military calls UAPs now, over the Pacific Ocean. Let's get to some of the encounters you guys had out there. Okay, so my job was communication, so I did like the wind birds, which would be about 40 feet off the deck. And, you know, you go up there and that basically told you the direction of the wind and all the other good stuff, how many nautical miles was coming towards us, which then affects the waves and everything else. All the communications from the bridge going down to the screws, which we had two of them. And then we also had the rudders. Everything goes through communications equipment and lines to, down both sides of the ship. All that was mine. Well, usually on our bridge, we have the battle bridge, and then we had the main bridge. The battle bridge was to take over if the main bridge was at war. Um, one of our instances is we actually um, blew up the deck of another ship during a Westpac. Um, basically, the commander said, fire the missiles, and he said, was it a scenario? And he said, I told you to fire, and we actually launched live missiles at another ship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's just some inside stuff that happened. But no, uh, that was another thing we had. So you be out there. So when you go over the ocean, um, different oceans have different colors. When you head towards um, Hawaii, it's this weird bluish sheen. But as we make waves and go through it, it would glow green because we'd aggravate the plankton and they'd light off. But we used to see shadows underneath the water we couldn't identify. They'd be large but they wouldn't be biological. So that was always, is it a biological? Is it not a biological? And usually we weren't able to identify it. Sometimes we'd uh, see things and they'd see lights, they'd report it. They'd see if they saw it on radar. We didn't really have sonar, but we had some. But um, how we- report this to the top uh, people? The, the so basically you have a lookout on the starboard and the south side. Anytime we made a contact, was which is we saw something we'd then report it. What happened next? Uh, usually they go back to the, I think they're called EWs, and they're the ones who have the radar in the back and see if they got any contacts. But after that, we don't really know. Were there reports of like hazing towards some of the people so that wanted to report the phenomenon? We'd report it, and then there was the, the hazing where it's like, oh, what'd you have in your coffee last night? Did someone spike it? You know, you had a little too much bug juice. That's what we used to call the sugar water they used to give us, the Kool-Aid that we used to clean metal with. That's how high it was in uh, sugar content. And yeah, that would be a constant thing. Hey, did you see the blue lights last night? Did you see the green lights? Hey, did you see that triangle? And you know, they just made fun of it and no one knew anything, but we were recorded to log everything. You know, these shadows, it's quite curious because I wanna know how fast were they moving? Was there a geometric shape to them? And wasn't there a collision as a so, fact, with your vessel? I was on call. I got woken up around three, three o'clock in the morning saying that we lost how fast we were going in the water. So basically I was sent down to the bows of the ship to lift up the pit sword. Maybe we picked up something, maybe we didn't. So basically it's a little hole you have to weasel in. We have the lights mounted on the side of the wall because there's no way to put a lamp in there. And it's 270 screws that go to two individual screws that lower this six foot tall metal sword with two eyelets over it that sends electricity through it. So as you pass through the water, it tells us how many knots we're traveling through the water. Uh, I got down there and it's gone. About three feet of it got sheared off. We collided with something 
no one tell me what it was. But I went up, started releasing the packet, and the ocean started to fill in. So I immediately went back down, screwed it down, tightened it back down, and then we had to go in for repairs. What was the depth at that point? You did We're in the middle of the ocean. We don't know, over 5,000 feet? I, I don't know, there's nothing out there. But a biological, I couldn't see snapping a three foot or a six foot tall sword. I went down to the packing and I'm about this high on top. And then we have about this much packing and the packing is basically metal, a whole bunch of rubber, and then screws on top so you can tighten it onto the sword. You released it and then you screwed it up. When we go out, after we leave the port, the sword goes down and it reads nautical miles on how fast we're traveling through the water. And it's at the very bow and the bottom of the ship. Now our ship is a 581 foot experimental vessel and it, they used to call it a gator freighter, but me and the sister ship, so I was a USS Coronado AGF-11, our sister ship was called the LaSalle. So that one we have, it's a flat bottom boat and it's designed to sink on the bottom. So in the old days, they would basically unload an entire platoon out of the back of it. Um, they welded it up. We still had Marines on board, but that was third fleet for everything that was going on because we have third fleet, uh, seventh fleet, different fleets control different fleets throughout this, throughout the Navy. And what about the pilots talking about what they saw? And some of those encounters where they're being scrubbed, right? From yeah, they, they immediately scrub it. They, it's like it doesn't exist. So what you're saying is that there's, when somebody wants to report some kind of phenomenon, either it's like what you are stating, that there's a collision with the craft, or there's visual contact, something within the skies in close proximity, they just want to deny and cover it. No, we're, we're forced. We can go to cabin's mess and be punished if we don't report it. What happens after it reports is a whole different subject. But we have log books, we have the sound power phone systems, that's not being recorded, but everybody's talking on the ship, everybody on that circuit. I can have 500 people on the same sound powered circuit, everybody hears it goes on. Every time we have a fire, everybody reports that. We have, you know, specialized things, you know, triangle, uh, you know, top of the triangle. So they taught us all these different things. Where is the communication breakdown from the, the crew to the higher ups to try to solve the, the, the mystery? That's it. There is no communication. The higher ups are notified and then they go down to the executor officer and then they go to whoever's in charge. But us, we're not privy to any of that information. We just report. Kind of like a mall cop. Uh, what is it? Observe and report. But once it goes into that, we don't know where it goes. So Tom, I want to get the kind of the idea of what the people on the ship were thinking. Was there conspiracies, people talking about it, tongue in cheek, maybe it could be extraterrestrial, a new life form or some kind of, you know, foreign adversary. With it's, it's basically you have a bunch of high school kids directly out of there seeing something and then talking to one another as the higher ups cover it up. It was an ongoing joke. It's kind of like hazing. You know, they used to say, hey, uh, go get some sound power phone batteries. It's sound powered. There is no such thing as that. You know, there was another joke where they used to say, hey, go get me a bulkhead remover. So I started walking around with a sledgehammer. I lay it on the DDR, which is a giant glass component that they track the ship on. It's like, it's just stupid, but it's kind of hazing that they do inside and internally. And then the constant joke is, did you have your coffee? Did someone spike your coffee? You know, what, you know, you've been drinking the cough medicine too much. You know, we can't drink on board, so we got to get it somewhere. You know what I mean? Do, did they think that it could be ET in nature or some unknown, you know, life form that they- We never felt life. threatened by it. Um, it would just be what we're reporting. But there was an, uh, a constant fear of being punished if we saw it and we didn't report it and someone else did report it. So there's a constant thing on, okay, so did I see it first? Was it on the port starboard side? Was it a uh, forward or a stern? Because we have lookouts at all areas who are supposed to, their identification is to find out where a contact is. So there's a constant thing on who sees it first and who reports it as kind of like competitive, but then if you see it and don't report it, you get punished. Yeah, so you guys can uh, hit me up on my YouTube channel. I do a lot of volunteer work for the US Forest Department, or kind of, uh, Azusa 6x6.
uh, uh, look it up in the search bar. So AZ USA 666. And then you'll see my big truck, my military truck, and I pull people out and try to rescue people and things like that. I don't charge. I just do it for subscriptions. Well, this guy's close to LA. He's got a lot of sightings within the area. Maybe we're going to get some videos from Tom in the future, but appreciate it, man. Crazy information. I have some contacts I want to call to to see if they know anything about what we may have collided with. Other than the, everyone knows that we collided in Mazelon. But everybody was that was during the day. So you collided with something. <laughs> no, we collided with some some cut off the pit sword and we don't know what it was. But I couldn't see a biological doing that. At least without, you know, coming to the top or doing something. It just doesn't make any sense. We want to thank Tom for coming forward and telling Third Phase of Moon and the world in regards to the UFO phenomenon that's happening and the cover up is real. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that thumbs up and that subscription button and the notification bell for all to be notified when Third Phase of Moon breaks the news. Blake Cousins, we'll see you next time. It's a mind-blowing situation. For the public, it's like, oh, a conspiracy theory, it's entertaining. But if you're actually in a responsible position and you find out that there's a whole secret government program that you don't know about, it's a shock. This report comes from a shadowy Pentagon department that was shut down in 2012. The disclosure movement has been hijacked by people parroting the narrative and the script being written by these black projects. I would say 90 plus percent of everything that's gonna come out is false. There's gonna be no more of these near misses. The most widely seen UFO right now is not alien, it's actually ours. it's a great cover story for all kinds of criminal activities. Blame it on the aliens, right? If we are being visited by interdimensional beings, we should know about it. This has the big disadvantage of the truth being much more unbelievable than the fiction. It's the crash retrievals that are the Rosetta Stone for solving the UFO Cover up. This is Operation Failsafe. The implications of this is the difference between extinction level civilization versus one that's going to take off to the stars.